Welcome to Whistler Wednesday. We want to thank you for joining us. The response was overwhelming and there's far many more people registered than anticipated. So it's great to see you all here. It just shows that this is an excellent, timely conversation. Um, I would like to acknowledge that the Whistler Film Festival is located on the unceded territory of the Squamish and Lillawatt nations and we honor their language, culture, culture and history. Um, for me, the big news is we're planning to be live again in December. We're going to be running it November, November 30th to December 4th. Um, please sign up for our newsletter so that you can catch up on, you know, new guests and who's, who's coming, what we're going to do. Um, I want to remind everyone that this is a safe space for sharing information and asking questions, but please put your questions into the chat. We have some pre-questions that people submitted earlier that we'll be trying to get to. And um, we might not have time for all questions. And if not, we'll try to address them afterwards and send that out as an email. Um, a reminder to keep your cameras and your microphones off. And um, we will we'll be talking to our advisor from the lab, the doc lab as well. Uh, I'm just gonna, Louise, you can keep letting people in for the next little bit. We'll try not to interrupt too, too much, but I would like to introduce you to Sarah Spring. Sarah is the fabulous facilitator of the event, and she's also the executive director of the Documentary Organization of Canada. So I'm going to pass it over to Sarah. I'm going to lurk in the background and um, feed you questions as they come up. Thank okay. you so much. Thanks, Shelley. Thanks so much for having us. Um, this, uh, this event came out of a discussion with the Whistler Film Festival about how to um, kind of build some more connections between them and the documentary community. Um, Doc has been around for almost 40 years. Next year is the 40th birthday, amazingly. And um, yeah, Doc represents about a thousand filmmakers across the country. We have chapters in every region. And um, you know, we mo mostly focus on advocacy work. We run some national programs and one of the programs we run is Festival Concierge, um, which is really shaped by Sean Farnell, who's one of our three consultants here today. And um, well, I mean, maybe I'll just, uh, I'll stop there and I'll let you three introduce yourselves and maybe Sean, you can go first and say a word about why you wanted to kind of reboot this and then Claire and Jason, you can talk a little bit about what you do and, uh, and uh, how you've been helping filmmakers and then we'll go to the conversation. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Lister, for hosting us here today. Um, yeah, so let's see, what do, I, what do I do? I guess I spent like what I call my first career programming documentaries at film festivals, including Chef and Hot Docs. And now I'm in the even more perilous task of figuring out with, you know, and, and always in between 10 and 20 productions I'm working on, how to navigate the festival circuit. Um, but I think what's important to state is how to navigate the festival circuit as part of an integrated marketing sales and distribution plan. And so um, while, I, you know, I do both with Festival Concierge and independently a number of sort of festival strategy consultations, um, where I'm most deeply engaged is as a consulting producer, trying to figure out all aspects of the, the back end for these incredi incredibly kind of difficult products in the marketplace, the one-off uh, feature length documentary, which is uh, what I specialize in. So, um, yes, uh, it's uh, often starts with festivals, sometimes not. And, um, and with Festival Concierge, it, it just, uh, the goal here was to create a kind of accessible service uh, to help uh, primarily entry level, but not always, uh, uh, you know, even mid-career filmmakers uh, are daunted by the festival circuit, try to help them navigate all the considerations one has to make when um, you know stepping into the festival uh, circuit, applying to, you know applying for those first festivals, setting a budget, defining your goals, figuring out which festivals are appropriate for your production, et cetera, et cetera. And it is um, you know a, a complicated maze of festivals out there, uh, somewhere between five thousand and eight thousand of these things around the world, depending on what you, how you define a film festival. So, I mean, it's, you know, both Claire and Jason and, and the support of Doc, we, we have the service running. Um, I think it's been helpful uh, uh, for a number of, of productions uh, over the last uh, couple of years, especially, you know, even through the COVID disruption, um, um, you know, festivals 
kept on going. And now uh, we can talk about a kind of full on festival season uh, this fall, definitely live events, less and less streaming, which is good. And um, so I'm happy to take any questions about any of that. Great, thanks so much, Sean. Claire, do you wanna say a couple words about uh, your, your work and, uh, and your experience and relationship with the concierge service? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for doing this, Sarah, and, and welcome as the, the new uh, head of DOC. And, um, and thank you, Sean, for spearheading this movement. It's of, uh, this is a real unique um, opportunity, and I guess I've been doing it for maybe over a year now or a year and a half or maybe more, um, but it's a real great opportunity to work with filmmakers as Sean said, at the back end to strategize for festivals and also um, just to, to navigate this labyrinth of um, how to get your film out, how to get it seen. Um, my background is um, kind of very varied. You know, I was a, a broadcaster and a commissioning editor. I worked for public television. And then also I worked um, as a programmer for a film festival. So I had a lot of more connections that were toward the back end, you know, with the distribution side. So I think it was really great to meet people who were um, not necessarily, as Sean said, emerging or beginning filmmakers, but they had either a work in progress or a film that was ready to go and get seen and distributed. So, um, it was, it's been a great experience, you know, and, and as you see, there are different kinds of um, ways that you can approach um, festival concierge from just working on your short at a one-time consultation to a longer kind of series of meetings with um, strategies and really cranking out a festival plan and so on. And I've been lucky to have um, met and worked with a lot of filmmakers on this spectrum. So, um, you know, what's interesting also I, I need to mention is that even though people come with a finished film and they want to talk about distribution in the back end, there are a lot of people who want to talk about their new projects and just kind of bounce some ideas off that might be in development. And that's been real helpful too, because, um, you know, this is something where um, as a filmmaker, you have to kind of keep going. And although COVID has restricted some possibilities in some ways, um, as Sean said, you know, it still goes on. And now that things are kind of ramping up again, it's getting um, so that there can be some kind of full, uh, full distribution plan. But I've often talked to filmmakers too about their projects in the pipeline or what they're thinking about and also ideas for funding. And it's a little complicated because most of the producers are Canadian and my familiarity is with US funds. Um, but on the other hand, it's great to be able to see their work as a continuum and try to get them started on the new project. So that's all I'll say for the moment if we can get into the hairy details um, later. Mm -hmm. So um, I can pass it on to Jason. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Claire. And I think it's also interesting, just before you go, Jason, because so many, you know, part of the festival concierge is, you know, what's the point of doing it? Some people are really, the point is to think about funding their next project. So it's great that they can bounce those ideas off you, Claire, when they're putting uh, their plan together. Um, oh, yeah, Jason, please talk about your work and uh, how you help filmmakers with the program. Sure, thanks so much. Um, thanks for the invitation all around. Uh, team for inviting me to be part of this project to begin with. I think it has been a year, year and a half, uh, and also to the festival. Um, would love to attend one day. It's always been virtual. I'm Jason Ryle, uh, Anishinaabe from Lake St. Martin First Nation, which is Treaty 2 territory uh, north of Winnipeg. I've split my time now between Winnipeg and Toronto primarily. Um, most of my professional life has been in association with an organization in Toronto called Imaginative, which is an Indigenous-run organization uh, that put on the Imaginative Film and Media Arts Festival, which is an Indigenous-focused film festival, um, screen-based works, um, and documentary was a huge part of that. Left that a couple of years uh, ago and really focusing on developing a producer track. I have a number of, of uh, documentary and, and um, fiction-related works in development currently. Um, also working as a programmer and consultant where possible, including, of course, uh, this gig. Um, 
you know, it's been great. I've really been focusing primarily on, uh, in, on the indigenous space. And this isn't necessarily only indigenous filmmakers. I mean, quite a lot of the, the, the projects that have come across um, my screen, my desk, uh, have been by non-Indigenous filmmakers who have projects with Indigenous content or characters or, or places or themes. Um, I think that's been very valuable for, you know, for the mutual discussions that we have in terms of strategy and awareness that, you know, there's a, there's a different lens put on uh, films now with Indigenous content, Indigenous characters, and really strategizing how to, um, you know, respond to the on-screen protocols and pathways that we developed at Imaginative with the Indigenous Screen Office and other partners, um, and really how festival programmers themselves too are really sort of shifting the gaze in terms of looking not just at Indigenous work, but um, BIPOC work larger and just, uh, you know, notions of, of authenticity and representation behind the camera to what we see on screen. Um, to Claire's point as well, a lot of the discussion has been about development. I really find that interesting. I love talking about that. Um, the short film space is really, you know, one of the areas that I, I've been specializing in. Um, but uh, yeah, the development aspect is something I find quite exciting because there's always a connection between the film that you're looking to get out there and seen by people and, uh, you know, your next projects that you have in development. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, my, I guess my first question to kick it off is, what is something that you're telling filmmakers now that you could never imagine having told them pre-pandemic? And then conversely, what is something that is totally irrelevant now that was so important pre-pandemic in terms of the festival plan? And I'll start with you, Jason, because we finished with you last time. Sure. I mean, for me, it's it's always about the digital space, right? Like, I mean, we were always talking about in cinema screenings, public screenings, in person screenings, and we never really had to give consideration to um, an online screening. Do you want that? What's geo blocking? Um, the hybrid scenario as well, too. I mean, all these questions that we find that we having to ask ourselves and encouraging, um, you know, the filmmakers, the film team to ask themselves when considering uh, a particular festival. Are they only um, a digital uh, festival for a particular year? Are they doing a hybrid? Are they geoblocked to a specific area? Is it, how long is it for? All these questions I think were questions that I would never have asked before clearly. Um, and it's still, they're still present. I mean, it seems like we're all moving back to the physical space, of course. I mean, seventh wave, just in the news today, we're in a seventh wave um, apparently. So who knows how this may impact things, but it seems like everything still is maintaining. Uh, uh, a path towards physical screenings. Um, but, you know, if I'm looking at something like Imaginative, I mean, they're having a full in-person in festival this year, but there's a component of it after the physical festival where a selection of the works will be online. So, I mean, that's a really key strategy. I question that I've asked a lot of, a lot of filmmakers is, well, what's your goal? Do you want a big festival screening? What kind? Is it just eyeballs that you really want in terms of you know getting as many people as possible to see your film? This all has sort of tied into that online screening space. Exactly, because a different festival is gonna have a different result. So I think that has to really be thought through. Um, what about you, Claire? Is there anything that is completely irrelevant today that used to be a big consideration or conversely something that you would definitely tell people to consider now is really, really important to their strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, let me just, uh, I forgot to do the land acknowledgement, which uh, to tell people where I'm speaking from. And I am in Los Angeles, California, and I am speaking on the land of the Tongva and specifically the Chumash people who are here. And thank you to them, to those ancestors, so we can do our work here and I can live in my beautiful home in Highland Park. <laughs> So uh, thanks for that. I agree with Jason about that digital space. I mean, a lot of people who were applying to festivals while I was doing our, our I, I guess we'll call them our mentees when we were when we were talking to them, uh, were looking at festivals who were uh, either just going all digital, not having any in-person screenings at all, and also finding out consequently that there were there was um, there was you know because they didn't have that interactive you know that in-person experience that they found it to be a little um, discouraging or you know, not looking forward to the digital screening as much as an in-person would and having in-person guests and 
not so much flying out there and the travel, but just having that presence, which is the kind of magic at film festivals, right? And so I think we've had a little bit of a mixed bag with the digital experience. Um, so, uh, so that we've been navigating, I think that'll change. Another thing is that um, even though festivals continue to be, you know, the kind of holy grail, um, we, we talked a lot, or I talked a lot with um, people who are interested in other kinds of distribution, namely broadcast or platform distribution, and especially with the film festivals being at a, you know, a kind of an unsure space, we were saying, well, maybe it's better to just get your film out uh, digitally or through broadcast, and so what is the best way to do that, even sometimes foregoing the festival strategy, which is interesting. Oh, no, oh, no. Do you have to add there, Sean? I mean, this is, you know, people, yep. is the festival, the festival circuit having maybe a different end goal now? Yeah, yeah, I'll tack on to the streaming, thoughts on the streaming thing first. Obviously, it was a, all a very interesting experiment the last couple of years. We would have never imagined that we were agreeing to stream our films worldwide or even geo-blocked in conjunction with a festival premiere or a festival run, but we, we were doing that with very mixed results uh, at best. Um, you know, I, I would say I changed my mind recently on that or, or, or changed my, let's say, forecast in the sense that I just thought that, you know, this hybridity, as we might call it, you know, live uh, in-person screenings and digital things. I don't think that's going to, that's going to remain not certainly not at the top festivals. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it's something I'm really reluctant to do with any new production now. Um, and, and certainly for that first kind of three months, let's say premiere window. So streaming, I think it was interesting. Some vesti vest vestiges of that will remain, I think, but overall, I just don't see it being a lasting legacy of this sort of pandemic disruption. Um, I think Claire's right uh, to point out that whilst many, if not most filmmakers are, you know, hopeful of a festival premiere and a festival kind of run, that um, there are many options and those have to be explored. And so I always start, and I think probably Claire and Jason are the same, it really starts with the film, right, and an assessment of what this production is and and how it how it kind of fits into this uh, world this market um, and um, that's where I think actually third party consultants are super useful I use them myself even though I'm also a consultant when I don't have uh, sort of clarity on something I'm working on um, and uh, I think it's important to get some third party eyes uh, on your film some thoughts because, you know, my experience, um, not all filmmakers, even experienced filmmakers sort of know what they have and, and, and have a sense of the market. So I think, the, you know, I think, you've, you know, when you're thinking about film festivals, and there's a question about budget here, I'll get to in a second. When you're thinking about film festivals and the strategy, the first thing you got to think about is, is this viable for this film? Is this the best, best path to market? And you have to, to get get input beyond, you know, yourself and your, your production partners um, and get get some third party eyes on that. Uh, and let me answer a, qu a question here quickly, because it is referring to uh, how much should you be budgeting um, for film festival submissions? In my opinion, like just to test the market over these three month window premiere windows that I usually sort of start with, it's about $2,500, um, I find. Um, you need about probably 25 to 30 festival submissions in a condensed period of time to really test the market, your kind of A, B, and C choices, so to speak. And I found that, you know, that's usually it takes around $2,500 to execute. Um, sorry for the bad news there. And, and um, I've seen filmmakers spend up to 10,000 on festival submissions. Uh, as part, again, you know, Sometimes that does you know, most of the time that doesn't make sense, but but um, you know if it's just not a again it's just not festivals. What's your market launch plan as a producer? Um, you know, okay, there's a budget for festivals. There's going to be you know there's you got to travel there. You just can't submit. So there's a whole market launch budget, and that's more like twenty five to fifty for a feature production. 
that should be budgeted as part of the financing of the film. Um, it takes money to put the film out there, um, even if it's a film that will attract sales and distribution attention uh, uh, downstream, you still need to get it to market and there are significant expenses. So actually, if you have a feature documentary, my recommendation is that you budget $25,000 for your, for broadly a market launch. If it's not festivals, you're gonna have to spend that money on aggregation or on, uh, you know, impact. You know, you you know, there might be other. There's ways to finance that in Canada, certainly to some extent. But as a producer, you to take sort of to take control of the situation and determine your destiny a bit. You need to budget for a market launch. So next discussion with Telefilm to make those allowable production costs. <laughs> yeah, that's the big problem. And then, you know, I think everyone's aware of it at this point, mm -hmm. that that's the big hole in our, you know, really, I mean, if we look at it, quite, quite good uh, funding system and, and comparably to other countries, especially uh, for our friends in the US, Claire, we do have, but unfortunately, a lot of some of the marketing supports from telephone, for example, aren't triggered until there's been festival invitations or there's a theatrical plan and that often comes too late, you still need the money. Uh, because you can't you do anything if you get if you get a grant, you know, any kind of funding like a week before your festival premiere, which is usually when that money arrives. So um, budget. And yeah, it is an advocacy point um, as well that I'm Sarah that I'm sure you're aware of. Noted. Um, so Claire, do you, I mean, because there's so many more festivals in the US, I'm curious if you're still seeing filmmakers actually have the revenues from their festival uh, screening fees. Is that still something that they can build on to grow that launch, um, you know, that launch budget or to help them really think through like they're sustaining themselves for six months after their film launches? I mean, you know, in Canada, there's less festivals and obviously going to festivals is more expensive, even around the country, let alone going to Europe or the US. But in the States, is that still a model? Can someone submit their film to say, a really robust list of um, you know fest environmental film festivals across the U.S. and, and say that they're going to be they can really realistically uh, sorry that that's going to bring in some money to float them as they do this whole process. Are you saying that they will get money from the festival either from in the screening? screening fees? Yeah, is that <clears throat> still a realistic thing to be thinking about? Sadly, no. I would say not. Um, you know, it would be great to do that. Um, and there are some festivals that will have screening fees, but they're very few. And even festivals, you know, you know, I worked at a festival and you, you Sean and Jason, you all worked at festivals. Sarah, you probably worked at a festival too. I mean, the reality is, you know, unless you're at Cannes or something, you know, festivals have very limited budgets and just scraping together travel or, or just to bear expenses without sponsors is difficult. Um, although I do tell filmmakers that always ask for a waiver when they submit to a festival um, and the worst that they can say is no, but you should ask for one, you know, just, you know, even though, you know, when I was a programmer, it bugged me. But on the other hand, it was like, if we wanted the film, and if, especially if the filmmaker was from a certain community, you know, sure, give them a waiver, or if they were from a certain country, or if they just, you know, they just didn't have the resources. You know, but on the other hand, those fees add up. So, um, but that's not, you know, going to sustain, you know, not paying an entry fee isn't going to sustain the filmmaker. But um, I just don't have that experience where um, even things like travel and accommodation is getting, I'm not sure what it's like now on the rebound. You know, if, um, I don't know, maybe Jason and Sean have thoughts on that. You know, if the, if the budgets are, the same or if there's you know if there's more money to support film filmmakers that way i just know that the screening fee issue is not in the states it's not it's not an issue it's like you know we're doing you a favor by showing your film you know yeah i mean i'll um, add i'll add some con some some context i'm dealing with festivals like constantly and um you can't ask and you often will receive screening fees um it's not a viable revenue model um, and you will never recover the costs of uh, uh, engaging with the festival circuit 
and very few festivals will, will offer. Some do proactively now, um, and it's certainly a lot of us are advocating in that space. And I plan, and I, in the fall, I'm, I'm going to really do another push on that myself. So yeah, screening fees always ask. So I mean, I guess the, the stock thing I would say if you get when you get invited to a, a film festival, um, there won't be a lot of detail, and there's a bunch of questions asked right away before. Uh, you know, you accept an invitation. First of all, you want to see if they've told you which program you're going to be in. Are you in the competition or not? Um, where are they putting you in? How, you know, how are they screening your film? I've, you know, with this sort of hybridity that's happening, I've had films invited to festivals and to find out only later that actually they're not having a physical screening, even though the festival is doing physical screenings, they're only pre being presented online. Um, so you want to ask these questions first. Screening fees is one of those questions. Travel support is one of those questions. You know, get the get some sort of you know. This is a negotiation when when you're invited to a festival. I know that you don't want to push buttons and all that, and and it is a kind of like um, supply. It's a difficult economy to be alone and working in because it's highly competitive and you're just happy for the invitation. But I mean, I think it's incumbent on all filmmakers to push festivals forward in terms of having a better deal for uh, what, I, what I call fair trade for filmmakers. And so ask the questions, be prepared for a lot of no's, but I think it's important to keep asking those questions. And, uh, and you'd be surprised, like, you know, the queer festival circuit, for instance, and the Jewish festival circuit, they have, you know, for, for years, most of those festivals have operated with, a, with screening fees as part of their economic model. Um, as Claire mentioned, so festivals are struggling. Um, you know, they're struggling to attract people back to their events, et cetera. The US model is a little different. Canadian festivals have, you know, can count on a certain amount of public support, additional support through pandemic disruption. But filmmakers, ask, ask the questions of festivals when they're inviting you. Get some clarity if that's not spelled out for you in the invitation letter. For sure. And, you know, Jason, you've expressed how you're really inspired by the short films that are out on the festival circuit. So I wonder if just you could speak to um, where you're seeing short films in this landscape at the moment. There was an interesting conversation on the doc discussion, which is our, our uh, like our conversation space within the documentary community in the last couple of days, just about short films. And, you know, where are you, are you seeing as the film festival circuit ramps up for the fall, TIFF is, you know, like full uh, preparation modes. Um, what's your sense in this, um, you know, physical festival circuit space that we're entering into again with all of this optimism? Um, how are short films landing? And what's your sense about this format at the moment in terms of what light is really thriving? Uh, what are people interested in? Well, I mean, I think it's a, I, I don't, or we'll see how it plays out. My sense is that nothing's really changing necessarily. I mean, I don't necessarily see the pandem pandemic having shifted things in terms of a ratio of short films in a conventional festival. Of course, if it's a short film festival specifically, those are still, you know, existent. Um, the smaller scale festivals in Canada, elsewhere, certainly in Europe, where the film festival circuit for short films is, is, is still pretty strong. Uh, you know, places like uh, Real Asian, Planet in Focus, Imaginative again. I mean, short films have always had a really strong presence there, partly because, too, they really actively support emerging and early career filmmakers. And oftentimes, shorts are really, uh, really that particular area. I, I really agree that, you know, asking for waivers is 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 a great way to do things even asking for discounts if those if those are there um and a lot of these kind of mid-range festivals in canada certainly and certainly in europe too do actively pay screening fees they're they're, they're small and it's almost just a, a requirement of their state funding in a lot of way a lot of their, their public funding um and certainly not enough to i think sustain anyone but important to have those fees also it really feels like in the last couple of years also during the pandemic, there's been a greater emphasis I've seen on festivals, uh, industry events, paying speakers as well. If, if you're selected to be part of a, of a panel or anything like that, it feels like you know there's a greater awareness that paying a screening, uh, a speaker fee, an appearance fee um, is, is also becoming um, par for the course in a lot of places, which is always great to see. But absolutely, keeping that pressure on uh, or, or asking those questions, as Sean said, uh, is important because I think this fall is going to be a really interesting space to see how it plays out. 
I think, you know, the programmers that I've spoken to, festivals that I've spoken to in relation to shorts, and this kind of an aspect of the hybrid situation carrying forward, I wonder if it's going to be primarily shorts, perhaps, that might be in that space. It's going to really depend, I think, on, of course, the film team's decision, the distributor's decision in that regard. Um, but I'll be interesting to see how programmers decide what's going to be in that um, uh, vestigial online space. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm just going to pause for a moment and um, we're going to go back to the Whistler team and Lynn Booth is going to talk a little bit about the Doc Lab and then we'll open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Sarah, and, uh, and all the panelists. It's so interesting to hear about uh, what's happening in the world of festivals with the Doc Lab. Um, I guess it's been hybrid the last year and online the year before that, like for the participants and uh, we're very excited this year because we're hopeful that we'll be able to join together at the Whistler Film Festival. And I can just tell you a little bit, I think Shelley's going to outline the deadlines for dates for applicants. But uh, what the Doc Lab is essentially is inviting filmmakers with projects, uh, feature documentary or limited series uh, that uh, are already in development at some level. And I think you need to have some sort of tape to show us in your pitch package, um, but we're really encouraging uh, applicants from diverse and underrepresented communities to uh, come forward and make an application this summer and join us. Uh, we do some work online. I think we started in November doing pitch development and we bring in experts from across the uh, country and other other places because it's virtual that part so we can really do some great work uh, we have six up to six applicants that we bring into the fold and it's it's fairly intense and, and projects do get really advanced and you get to meet uh, people decision makers uh, like yourselves at the festivals and also broadcasters and other funders uh, and really experienced story editors and other creative people who are, you know, just wonderful resources for filmmakers. So um, we will be looking forward to uh, meeting you and all the participants get your applicants. If you know a filmmaker who wants to uh, have a community of support, please uh, let them know about the Whistler Film Festival Doc Lab. Thank you. Okay, excellent. And I put the dates into the chat. Okay, I'm just going to bring the others back. There we go. Okay, Sarah, did you you see there's quite a few questions. So do you want to do you want me to feed you some questions or do you already have a plan? Well, would you like me to ask a couple of the questions that came in ahead of time? Yes, please. Okay, sure. So um, there's a question about the best way to market your film on a limited budget. Uh, so we've talked a little bit about the 2500 that filmmakers should have aside for submissions, but in terms of their festival pitch package, um, what is a good way? I mean, first of all, maybe you could say what that is, and then uh, what's a good way to market it to make yourself stand out a little bit? Should they definitely have press? If they don't have press, what can they do to just sort of think about that pitch package for the festival's mission. What's the uh, I'll, I can jump in. First of all, um, okay, I'm gonna pick this up. For me, it's always less is more, to be honest. Um, you know, I, I, I see a lot, you know, mostly this is all happens through Film Freeway, right? I mean, 90% of the festivals now are on Film Freeway. Maybe, let's say maybe 80%. But regardless, it's pretty much they're all asking for the same thing. You know, um, I wouldn't worry about spending a lot on things like a poster um, and too many design materials um, prior to any festival premiere. I mean, for me, the most important thing is that the film is done, done. And in other words, it's, it's like definitely the picture is like locked tight. You're not moving pieces around. You know, I've seen too many regrets of filmmakers that submitted their earlier versions that were improved upon later. You got really one chance in this attention economy. And you're talking about like at best two or three people at a festival looking at your film and deciding its fate to begin with. You want to be done, even if you know, 
even if it's not super time sensitive in terms of a topic with the documentary, you want, you know, you want everything to be done. You want, you, you want all the temp elements in there. You don't want temp music. You, you want to put your best foot forward, you know? Um, yeah, sometimes there's a fine line, you know, you, you're 95% you're away there. You want to meet deadlines for the fall, which I've already passed, by the way, but let's say now for sun, Info and Sundance would be the next, it was tomorrow, by the way, the, uh, the final deadline. And then next would be the, the winter season. So the film, first thing is make sure the film's done uh, before you submit it. If you don't have great production stills, and a lot of docs don't, don't put them in the application. It muddies the water uh, in the sense that I don't want to be like, we're talking about like an attention economy. This is what happens. And Jason, you can confirm this because you're in the midst of it now. I'm a festival programmer. Uh, I'm on Film Freeway, tips on Film Freeway. I'm, you know, this is the brutal truth uh, is that you're dealing with people who are looking at, you know, the Vimeo link in one eye, maybe scanning your materials, maybe peeking over at their email. Um, I don't want too much clutter personally. So I'm like, have the good three to five lines synopsis in there because they're not going to read a three paragraph synopsis. What is, how do you want to frame this film very uh, efficiently and elegantly so that when they press play, they, they kind of have a sense of like, what's their first expectation here, you know? So does that a little bit of information? I'm also a big fan of like the filmmaker statement. Okay, why did, you know, what's your intent? Why'd you make this film? Again, 150 words max. We're not talking about people who are doing a lot of reading here. Um, um, the most important thing is not that, I think unless you ha don't have great materials that really add resonance in terms of the frame around the film, don't put it in there yet. You know, most of the films that are the big films that get into festivals, they don't have any of this stuff ready, right? It's all about the film. So um, don't get too hung up on spending a lot of money on materials because you're gonna change those materials anyway, probably once you get a better read on your film. Uh, so don't worry about a poster unless you just have to have a great poster image that you know you're locked into for the life of the film. Um, so I guess to summarize, like for me, it's less is more. Um, just based on my experience as a programmer, not looking at all this. You know, I didn't look through 12 page press kits and all this stuff, right? If I had more questions, I asked the filmmaker. I want the focus to be on the film and I want to guide that attention as efficiently as possible with, with, uh, with as little external information as possible. Jason, do you have any, I mean, you are in the thick of it. What's your, what's your, you're nodding a lot here to what Sean's saying. Yes, yes, yes. Sean is speaking the gospel. Um, you know, for me also, I mean, what I will add is you know with my particular focus uh, generally on indigenous films i mean i will also want to see you know mention of a connection to the community or the subject matter um, which again can be very short which is why something like the filmmaker statement i think is really important some festivals including tiff do are you know proactively asking uh questions about you know connection to um the subject matter if one isn't necessarily from that community uh so those things are useful but I absolutely agree. I mean, I think, you know, wait, don't spend your time and resources developing an, an EPK or, you know, this really in-depth website um, until you really have your kind of initial festivals in place. They may actually not even be festivals where you necessarily need that kind of information. Um, and I agree, less is more. Once kind of a, a film is out there, I really like, you know, a simple website that just has some information, some of this content. EPKs can be fine for certain films, but I don't think that every film necessarily needs one. And um, just about, you know, the small festival circuit or B festival and A festival, um, you know, Claire, if someone goes to you with their film and they're saying, I want TIFF Sundance, or nothing. Um, do you do you find that you know having them understand the benefits of another festival circuit as like a really robust way to meet their goals? I mean, depending what their goals are, but do you find that you're often um, informing filmmakers using the service about some of the other routes that can help them um, reach, or maybe some of the drawbacks of being a lone Canadian film at a larger festival? Yeah, I think that um, I think that that. Um that is usually evident 
are obvious to the filmmaker, you know, especially if they have a film that is for, you know, a film that's an environmental film or a queer film or something that will, will speak to a, a specific audience much more than to a general audience. Um, to the point of, um, but back to the point, what Jason and Sean were doing, I agree with everything they say, less is more, but also that, um, I think that uh, there was a question, I think it was from Catherine Parsons about transparency, you know, festivals and, you know, not knowing what the process, transparency and not knowing what the process was and not knowing for sure if your film has been screened and given that there's so much going on and we're inundated or programmers are inundated by viewing. But I have to say from my experience that we made sure that there were two sets of eyes on or three sets of eyes on every film that was initially submitted. So it didn't, you know, just get, you know, swept other under the rug or we just, you know, ignored films and really gave them due consideration. Um, but on the other hand, there is this question of volume, which there is a lot. So the, 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 I would personally, and I don't think everyone does this, but I would just go to the film first without even reading the synopsis or the treatment and see, can this you know, film tell its own story? Do I really need to have, because you know, the audience is gonna have, isn't gonna have a proposal. So, um, and if that's kind of the proof of the pudding, but I know a lot of other people like to, like to I, I think the filmmaker statement is actually really useful, but I think that's something that um, for me, I was more happy to read that after I thought the film is a go, you know, but um, back to your other question, I think that it's, you know, I think it's obvious for filmmakers that they could go to another route instead of, you know, the, the A-list festivals all the time. Um, but then there's also some happy surprises. So you never know. There's this story about the the film for Sama, you know, about the Syrian uh, the Syrian journalist, and you know she didn't want to submit to Khan, and her husband said, "Oh, just do it, whatever. It's not going to hurt." And they did, and they got in, and it became kind of an international sensation after that. So there's always that, but those stories are rare. And um, sometimes the, the path is a little more obvious about which one we should take. There was a question that came in earlier about um, the relationship with programmers. And I'm sure you've all experienced, uh, you know, just being on different sides of that line and having people think, well, you know, I need to, I need to get to know you. I need to somehow pitch you personally. I need to find you at the festival the previous year to let you know this other film's coming up. You know, this whole idea of tracking a filmmaker, tracking a film, how important is that to getting your film and launching it on the circuit? I mean, it's it's rare that the, the can story is a great one. And obviously it's it's rare that someone will get to do that. But you know, this whole tracking filmmakers and films process and establishing relationships with programmers, how important is that, would you say? Um, I think filmmakers can kind of over over determine that important sometimes. So again, I, to me, the film always has to do the heavy lifting. Obviously, as you become more established as a filmmaker, you're going to have more direct uh, paths. And that's the whole point of getting into the festival world is to build your network. And it's going to get easier over time, not always easy. And we, you know, I've seen many experienced uh, filmmakers uh, have had a lot of success on the festival have a film that doesn't land and, and they got it they also get in the nose so I think a lot of filmmakers worry that it's who you know or you need some kind of inside track the programmers that I know uh, are looking for the best films possible and they want a sense of discovery and they have to say no to their friends and colleagues all the time as well so I wouldn't overdetermine that especially if you're a, a, a sort of you know coming into this world let's say I wouldn't get too stressed about that, oh, I, you know, it's a kind of fallback excuse. I didn't know anyone and I couldn't get in. It's not, it's, it's kind of overdetermined. I mean, uh, that, being, that being said, on the flip side, um, you know, can be helpful, you know, and, and that's, but you, you know, if nobody's coming into this world with a established network of professional contacts. I mean, I'm not a big fan of like all these, uh, Kind of pitch emails that a new filmmaker might feel they got to send to a thousand programmers. Uh, you're just not going to get a lot of traction that way. 
Um, you know, I think a good way to reach out to a programmer, for instance, let's say you get invited to, I mean, let me use an example. Let's say you get invited, you're an Edmonton based filmmaker and, you know, the Edmonton Film Festival is all over you. They know about your film and they want to, they want to show you, you know, that, that's a bad example, actually, because Edmonton's after TIFF. Sometimes you might want to get in touch with a festival with a very specific question. Um, festival X, which is just before yours, is interested in playing my film. However, I know that you want, uh, you know, you probably prefer premieres. You know, would accepting this festival um, impact your decision? That's a way to expedite a decision often. They might say, oh, no, sorry, we're, we're passing. At least, you know, they might say, well, can you hold a bit? Give us some time, to, you know? So like, if you have a specific reason to contact a programmer with a valid question that you're grappling with, that's a good, but just a sort of like this notion that you've got to now like pitch your own film to a programmer. They just, you know, like, like, like us all, we're just overwhelmed with these kinds of emails. And, and so I wouldn't worry too much about that. Is my, that's my You know, I'll, I'll add this, I mean, additional angle is the smaller film festivals that have very specific programming focuses like imaginative or festivals in the queer space or other cultural groups, for example. I mean, they're a smaller community pool generally. Um, I mean, you're still very much looking for uh you know films that inspire films that that move you all those things that you normally look for in a larger festival but i mean a lot of the times too festivals such as those are also contributing to the development of that particular sector and, and the development of those particular filmmakers so those can also really be great avenues to connecting to larger festivals as well uh, you know, there's a great relationship always been between TIFF and Imaginative, for example, um, here in Toronto. And so they can be launch pads to that broader connection. But I mean, ultimately, it, it is just as I, I think as Sean says. And just back to Claire's point, it, you know, the volume here is staggering, right? You're talking about with festivals like TIFF or Sundance or, you know, the sort of top five, even the top five in the documentary category, Intel Hot Docs, UPH Docs other visions a couple others you're talking you're talking about like thousands of submissions you're talking about like a for an unsolicited documentary that's submitted to the festival less than a two percent chance of being selected um it's a you know it's a tough tough business we're in here and most of the time we get a no um so you just have to say you know build that into your you know, uh, just like resilience plan <laughs> to, to understand that it is extremely difficult to crack this nut and, 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 uh, and not to take it too personally. Just in terms of the percents, would you say that it rings true to you, this, this number came up, about 10% of submissions will get in if a filmmaker submits to, if they're thinking about all the festivals they're gonna send to, does that number sound correct to the three of you? In my experience, uh, 20 to 30 percent is excellent you know you know and I, i've had a few recent you know, it's pretty much holds true that if you get into 20 or 30 percent of the festivals you submit to you've done quite well um uh 10 percent is pretty good as well uh more often than that it's below that i'm talking about for the you know independent documentary maker without a track record etc it's it's below 10%. So like if you submit to 50 festivals, hopefully you get like your five in there somewhere to start. You know, also, I mean, really understanding your space, your place in the market, obviously is, is important, but for, for this reason too, I mean, festivals, and we, we all kill our darlings as programmers at various points in, in the programming process. And, um, you know, there's a number of reasons why a film is programmed or not. Um, and understanding if your film is from a region, for example, that's historically underrepresented um, in a particular festival can also be an advantage and really identifying those parts of it in terms of your submission uh, can raise some attention for your film too. Yeah, I just respond to Catherine's point that around the 2% number, you know, assuming it's an open call. Uh, I'm talking about like unsolicited submissions. You know, the best way to get into film festivals uh, is to be in other film festivals. <laughs> so you can see mm -hmm. the paradox there, first of all, especially the smaller festivals, the programming from the circuit, right? 
Um, so you're competing with all the films that were selected to the bigger festivals, et cetera. That makes up the bulk of the smaller festivals program, A. Uh, B, with the bigger festivals, especially Sundance, to some extent, like in the documentary space, IDFA, um, lesser TIFF, definitely hot docs. You've got a number like of films coming through the labs and the funding programs, and they have an inside track, right? The forums. So like getting into those sort of like upstream programs that festivals are, the big institutional festivals run now is an inside track to getting into that festival. Um, um, not that Sundance or Hot Docs or any of these festivals don't say no to films they funded or come through their labs, et cetera. But obviously there's an inside track there um, and you're on their radar and it's not unsolicited. They know the project. Sometimes there's a church state separation between let's forums and the labs and the festival programmers, but you know, it's not that much separation. And so like that, you know, that's an inside track. So like, you know, like when you're an unsolicited filmmaker, yeah, it's one, 2%, that's, that's, ju that's just the stats. Yeah, I agree. I agree, Sean. I think that it's um, it's interesting that you know a lot of the it, it's a lot of the festival programmers um, they some of them track filmmakers. You know, it's like they'll send a like, oh, I'm working on film. Can you look at a rough cut or something? And then it'll be done in a few years. But most often they're looking at finished films. But on, on the other hand, if you're looking, you're pitching at a forum or you're pitching to broadcasters or you have something in development, you were at a lab, then you do have a kind of relationship with those people. And even though they're not festival programmers, they're usually part of this circuit of um, gatekeepers that will give you visibility for your project. So that's probably a better way of getting attention instead of you know, trying to solicit the programmer um, on the other hand, you know, like if you're looking for distribution later on and you have pitched your project to all these broadcasters or to HBO or to Netflix, then you can definitely remind them of that project and say, I finished the project that I pitched to you two years ago, or it's going to premiere at, at TIFF or at this festival, and there's your chance to see it. And so that's another way you could get that attention I really, I really think that an, an, an under-discussed part of the festival distribution is the pitch platforms and the pitch sessions. I think that's something that filmmakers don't realize necessarily. It's not just there to fund your film. It's really part of your overall launch strategy. Because the more people that are seeing you talk about your film for years, they're just aware that it rings a bell. Sometimes it's as simple as I've heard of that film. And just the name recognition you just it, it can go a long way to just oh I'm definitely going to watch it and maybe I'll pay a tiny bit more attention than I would have otherwise. So you know people think about the IFA forum, Hot Docs forum, or CPH forum as um, you know places to fund your film, but it's really you know I think filmmakers need to think about it as part of a long pipeline of of um, moving your film forward. Uh, so there's only five more minutes. Uh, for questions, if anyone has something they want to post in the chat, if I've forgotten anything, uh, please tag it. Shelly, if there's something, did you want to jump in with anything, uh, a last question or two? There were a couple um, of earlier questions, sorry to jump in. Someone asked, please. can we upgrade later? Yes, you can. Can you choose your, um, your consultant? Yes, you can. Yes, absolutely. And um, yeah, I think uh, so. There's different levels of the festival concierge program. You can have, you know, a 30 minute consultation, you can have a longer consultation, you can have a series of consultations. So it really is tailored to what your needs are and uh, pretty easy to navigate, I think. Uh, but yeah, you know, we're here to, to help you through that if you need any assistance going through the program. Um, are there any kind of last thoughts? I'm curious, and we're heading into an exciting fall. Uh, do any of you want to mention, um, you know, what are your expectations about the festival circuit? I mean, we haven't been here in three years. Uh, what are your thoughts as we head into, every, you know, TIFF to Whistler, or like September to December? You know, what are you looking at here? What are you keeping an eye on in terms of uh, what people should be thinking about with their films? 
Well, I, I mean, it's going to be, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, most of the festivals I'm talking to are seeing more submissions uh, than they have over the last few years. It's, so it's going to be highly competitive. I mean, this is the time when we're going to start hearing about TIFF and all that. So um, it's definitely going to be super busy. Um, you know, we're still in this sort of tentative uh, kind of stage with emerging out, out of COVID that We'll see what the fall looks like um, in terms of like in-person attendance. But I have a lot of filmmakers that have been out and about on the circuit over the last few months, and they've had full screenings uh, in many cases. And, and there's been people, you know, there returning. I, I'm curious to know how uh, will people do to be doing the kind of intercontinental travel that we're all used to. Will people kind of be sticking on their continent a bit more? So maybe I go to more U.S. festivals, less European festivals. What does that look like? You know, um, I mean, I haven't traveled yet, but I kind of have some plans to do so in the fall. So like, yeah, what is the return here? I, my sense is that we're going to see a little bit more regionalization uh, a bit. People are going to travel a little less for obvious reasons. Um, and uh, I think that's actually a good thing um, where we're going to be a bit more spread out. Maybe we go to more smaller events and all congregating at all these larger events. These are the kind, I mean, I don't know, we'll see, but these are the kinds of things I'm like, what, you know, what is this going to look like? Um, I mean, unfortunately, some of the in-person events have also been like, you know, a little bit of super spreader events too. So that's been, mm -hmm. you know, that's, I know with Tribeca, there was, uh, had a few crews there and like. Copenhagen, got everybody Copenhagen, got COVID, got everybody sick, went to so. a party and then they all got sick. So and the same thing. I mean, yeah, yeah, we're still in. People are yeah. So I'm I'm anxious. I'm gonna be out there, I guess, at some point, and I'm curious to see what it all looks like. You know. Any last thoughts, uh, Jason or Claire, to close it up? I'm curious, Jason, about what you're gonna do for Imaginative. Well, I'm not involved with Imaginative any longer, but I'm gonna be a happy, happy audience member you were. <laughs> yeah, yeah i mean i think you know a festival uh you know like that and there's several at that scale i mean no one signed up for the past couple of years and they were really kind of running a production studio as opposed to putting on a festival that brings people together in a cinema so i'm really looking forward um to that aspect of it the travel component is a big question are people going to come uh the cost of travel is is so expensive right now accommodation is, is astronomical so I mean that's going to limit festivals abilities to support people to come so it may very well be regional or maybe just fewer spots on a calendar um, but I'm I'm really looking forward to the coming together again and, and celebrating these films hopefully we'll all be together at a festival soon in person with all of you um, I'll hand it over to Shelley to close it out I just want to thank the three of you so much for this conversation I think it's really it's great to check in um, you know, pretty regularly as things are changing so rapidly. So um, I appreciate this and I hope we can do it again soon.